Welcome to the Myth, Legends and Lore podcast. Before we venture into another Irish legend, I'd like to introduce you to Kimberly and Kristen of the Murder and Myths podcast. I'm continuously impressed with every new episode of this podcast, and as a lover of mystery and mythology, I can't help but appreciate what these talented ladies have created. The level of research they do is remarkable, and their ability to keep the audience hanging onto every word is smashing, as well as their sense of humour. The reaction segments are brilliant, one of my favourite parts. Please check out Murder and Myths. This is Kimberly. And I'm Kristen, hosts of the Murder and Myths podcast. In our podcast, we tackle a common theme and bring you two stories. One of true crime, where I discuss murder and unsolved cases. And one of mythology, where I delve into the darker side of Norse, Egyptian, and other lesser known mythos. You can find us on Twitter at Murder and Myths and our website, murderandmyths.com. Our new episodes are available on Apple Podcast, Stitcher, and Spotify. So please leave us a review and let us know what you think. And don't forget, come for the murder and stay for the myths. The Story of the Children of Lear Long ago there dwelt in Ireland the race called by the name of the Danannan, or people of the goddess Dana. They were a folk who delighted in beauty and gaiety, and in fighting and feasting, and loved to go gloriously apparelled, and to have their weapons and household vessels adorned with jewels and gold. They were also skilled in magic arts, and their harpers could make music so enchanting that a man who heard it would fight, or love, or sleep, or forget all earthly things, as they who touched the strings would will him to do. In later times, the Danans had to dispute the sovereignty of Ireland with another race, the children of Milad, whom men called the Milesians, and after much fighting they were vanquished. Then, by their sorceries and enchantments, when they could not prevail against the invaders, they made themselves invisible and they have dwelt ever since in the fairy mounds and wraths of Ireland, where their shining palaces are hidden from mortal eyes. They are now called the She, or fairy folk of Erin, and the faint strains of unearthly music that may be heard at times by those who wander at night near to their haunts come from the harpers and pipers who play for the people of Dana at their revels in the bright world underground. At the time when this tale begins, The people of Dana were still the lords of Ireland, for the Milesians had not yet come. They were divided, it is said, into many families and clans, and it seemed good to them that their chiefs should assemble together and choose one to be king and ruler over the whole people. So they met in a great assembly for this purpose, and found that five of the greatest lords all desired the sovereignty of Erin. These five were Bov the Red and Ibrich of Asuru, and Lear from the Hill of the White Field, which is on Sleeve Fod in Armagh and Midir the Proud, who dwelt at Sleeve Callery in Logford, and Angus of the Bruin na Boina, which is now Newgrange on the River Boyne, where his mighty mound is still to be seen. All the Danon lords saving these five went into council together, and their decision was to give the sovereignty to Bov the Red, partly because he was the eldest, and partly because his father was the Dagda, mightiest of the Danans, and partly because he himself was the most deserving of the five. All were content with this, save only Lear, who thought himself the fittest for royal rule, so he went away from the assembly in anger, taking leave of no one. When this became known, the Danan lords would have pursued Lear to burn his palace and inflict punishment, and wounding on himself for refusing obedience and fealty to him, whom the assembly had chosen to reign over them. But both the red forbade them, for he would not have war among the Danans, and he said, I am none the less the king of the people of Dana, because this man would not do homage to me. Now Bob the Red came ere to long hear of it, and he said, If Lear would choose to have my help and friendship now, I can serve him well. For his wife is no longer living, and I have three maidens, daughters of a friend, in fosterage with me, namely Eva, Eva, and Elva, and there are none fairer and of better name in Erin. 
one of these might take to wife. And the lords of the Danans heard what he had said, and answered that it was true and well bethought. So messengers were sent to Lear, to say that if he were willing to yield sovereignty to Bov the Red, he might make alliance with him and wed one of his foster children. To Lear, having been thus greatly entreated, it seemed a good end to the feud, and he agreed to the marriage. So the following day, he set out with a train of fifty chariots from the hill of the White Field, and journeyed straight for the palace of Bov the Red, which was by Loch Derg on the river Shannon. Arriving there, he found about him nothing but joy and glad faces, for the renewal of amity and concord, and his people were welcomed and well entreated and handsomely entertained for the night. And there sat the three maidens on the same couch with the Danan queen, and Bob the Red bade Lear choose which one he would have to wife. The maidens are all fair and noble, said Lear, but the eldest is first in consideration and honour, and it is she that I will take, if she is willing. The eldest is Ava, said Bob the Red, and she will wed thee if it is pleasing. It is pleasing, said Lear, and the pair were wedded that same night. Lear abode for fourteen days in the palace of Bov the Red, and then departed with his bride to make a great wedding feast among his own people. In due time after this, Ava, wife of Lear, bore him two fair children at birth, a daughter and a son. The daughter's name was Finella of the Fair Shoulder, and the son's name was Hugh, and again she bore him two sons, Fucra and Con, and at their birth she died. At this Lear was sorely grieved and afflicted, and but for the great love he bore to his four children, he would gladly have died too. When the folk at the palace above the red heard that, they were also sorely grieved at the death of their foster child, and they lamented her with keening and with weeping. Above the red said, We grieve for this maiden non account of the good man we gave to her, and for his friendship and fellowship. Howbeit our friendship shall not be sundered, for we shall give to him a wife, her sister, namely Ava. Word of this was brought to Lear, and he went once more to Loch Derg, to the palace above the red, and there he took to wife Ava, the fair and wise, and brought her to his home. And Ava held the children of Lear and of her sister in honour and affection, for indeed no one could behold these four children without giving them the love of their soul. For the love of them too came Bov the red often to the house of Lear, and he would take them to his own house at times and let them spend a while there and then to their own home once more. All of the people of Dana who came visiting and feasting to Lear had joy and delight in the children, for their beauty and gentleness, and the love of their father for them was exceedingly great, so that he would rise very early every morning to lie down among them and play. Only, alas, a fire of jealousy began to burn at last in the breast of Apha, and hatred and bitter ill-will grew in her mind towards the children of Lear and she feigned an illness and lay under it for most of a year, meditating a black and evil deed. At last she said that a journey from home might recover her, and she bade her chariot to be yoked and set out, taking with her the four children. Fenella was sorely unwilling to go with her on that journey, for she had a misgiving, and a prevision of treachery and of kinslaying against her in the mind of Apha. Yet she was not able to avoid the mischief that was destined for her. So Eva journeyed away from the hill of the white field, and when she had come some way, she spoke to her people and said, Kill me, I pray you, the four children of Lear, who have taken the love of their father from me, and you may ask of what reward you will. Not so, said they. By us they shall never be killed. It is an evil deed that you have thought of, and it is evil that you have spoken of it. But when they would not consent to her will, she drew a sword, and would have slain the children herself. But her womanhood overcame her and she could not. So they journeyed on westward till they came to the shores of Loch Derivara, and there they made a halt, and the horses were outspanned. Aoife bade the children bathe and swim in the lake, and they did so. Then Aoife, by druid spells and witchcraft, put on each of the children the form of a pure white swan, and she cried to them, Out on the lake with you children of Lear, cry with the waterfowl over the mere. Breed and seed you'll ne'er shall see, woeful the tale to your friends shall be. The four swans turned their faces towards the women, and Fenella spoke to her and said, 
evil is thy deed, Aether, to destroy us thus without a cause. And think not that thou shalt escape punishment for it. Assign us even some period to the ruin and destruction that thou hast brought upon us. I shall do that, said Aether, and this is this. In your present forms you shall abide, and none shall release you till the women of the south be mated to the man of the north. Three hundred years you shall be on the waters of Derivara, and three hundred upon the straits of Moyle between Erin and Alba, and three hundred in the seas by Eris and Inish glory, and then shall the enchantment have an end. Upon this, Eva was smitten with repentance, and she said, Since I may not henceforth undo what has been done, I give you this, that you shall keep your human speech, and you shall sing sad music such as no music in the world can equal, and you shall have your reason and your human will, that the bird shape may not wholly destroy you. Then she became as one possessed, and cried wildly like a prophetess in her trance. Ye with the white faces, ye with the stammering Gaelic on your tongues, soft was your nurture in the king's house, now you shall know the buffeting wind, nine hundred years upon the tide. The heart of Lear shall bleed. None of his victories shall stead him now. Woe to me that I shall hear his groan. Woe that I have deserved his wrath. Then they caught and yoked her horses, and Eva went on her way till she reached the palace above the red. Here she and her folk were welcomed and entertained, and above the red inquired of her why she had not brought with her the children of Lear. I brought them not, she replied, because Lear loves thee not, and he fears that if he sends his children to thee, thou wouldst capture them and hold them for hostages. That is strange, said Bob the Red, for I love those children as if they were my own. And his mind misgave him some treachery that had been wrought, and he sent messengers privily northwards to the hill of the white field. For what have you come? asked Lear. To bring your children to Bob the Red, said they. Did they not reach you with Aphra? said Lear. Nay, said the messengers, but Aphra said you would not permit them to go with her. Then fear and trouble came upon Lear, for he surmised that Aphra had wrought evil upon the children. So his horses were yoked and he set out upon the road southwards until he reached the shores of Lokterivara. But as he passed by the water, Finola saw the train of horsemen and chariots she cried to her brothers to come to the shore, for, said she, these can only be the company of our father, who have come to follow and seek for us. Lear, by the margin of the lake, saw the four swans, and heard them talking with human voices, and he halted and spoke to them. Then said Finola, Know, O Lear, that we are thy four children, and that she who has wrought this ruin upon us is thy wife and our mother's sister through bitterness of her jealousy. Lear was glad to know that they were at least living, and he said, It is possible to put your own forms upon you again. It is not possible, said Finola, for all the men of earth could not release us until the women of the south be mated with the man of the north. Then Lear and his people cried aloud in grief and lamentation, and Lear entreated the swans to come on land and abide with him, since they had their human speech and reason. But Fenella said, That may not be, for we may not company with men any longer, but abide on the waters of Erin nine hundred years. But we still have our Gaelic speech, and moreover we have the gift of uttering sad music, so that no man who hears it thinks aught worth in the world save to listen to the music forever. Do you abide by the shore for this night, and we will sing to you. So Lear and his people listened all night to the singing of the swans, nor could they move or speak till morning, for all the high sorrows of the world were in that music, and it plunged them into dreams that could not be uttered. The next day, Lear took leave of his children and went to the palace above the red. Above reproached him that he had not brought with him his children. Woe is me, said Lear. It was not I that would not bring them, but Aether there, your own foster child and their mother's sister, she put upon them the forms of four snow-white swans, and there they are on the loch of Derivara for all men to see, but they have kept still their reason and their human voice, and their Gaelic. Above the red started when he heard this, and he knew what Lear had said was true, 
Fiercely he turned to Apha and said, This treachery will be worse, Apha, for you than for them, for they shall be released in the end of time, but thy punishment shall be forever. Then he smote her with a druid wand, and she became a demon of the air, and flew shrieking from the hall, and in that form she still abides to this day. As for Bob the Red, he came with his nobles and attendants to the shores of Loch Derivara, and there he made an encampment, and the swans conversed with them and sang. And as the thing became known, other tribes and clans of the people of Dana would have also come from every part of Erin to stay a while and listen to the swans, before again departing to their homes. And most of all came their own friends and fellow pupils of the Hill of the White Field. No such music as theirs, say the historians of ancient times, ever was there heard in Erin. For foes who heard it were at peace, and men stricken with pain or sickness fell to their ills no more, and the memory of it remained with them when they went away. A great peace and a sweetness and gentleness was in the land of Erin for those three hundred years that the swans abode on the waters of Derivara. But one day Fenella said to her brethren, Do you know, my dear ones, that the end of our time here has come? We have only this night. Then a great sorrow and distress overcame them, for in the converse with their father and kinsfolk and friends, they had half forgotten that they were no longer men, and that they loved their home on Loch Derivara, and feared the angry waves of the cold northern sea. But early the next day they came to the lockside to speak with Bob the Red and with their father, and to bid them farewell, and Finella sang to them her last lament. Then the four swans rose in the air and flew northward till they were seen no more, and great was the grief among those they left behind. And Bob the Red let it be proclaimed throughout the length and breadth of Erin that no man should henceforth presume to kill a swan, lest it might be a chance to kill one of the children of Lear. Far different was the dwelling place which the swans now came to, from that which they had known on Loch Derivara. On either side of them, to the north and south, stretched a wide coast as far as the eye could see, beset with black rocks and great precipices, and it ran by fiercely the salt bitter tides of an ever angry sea, cold and grey and misty, and their hearts sank to behold it, and to think that they must abide there for three hundred years. Ere long one night, there came a thick, murky tempest upon them, and Finella said, In this black and violent night, my brothers, we may be driven apart from each other. Let us therefore appoint a meeting place, where we may come together again when the tempest is overpassed. And they settled to meet at the seal rock, for this rock they had all learned to know. By midnight the hurricane descended upon the straits of Moyle, and the waves roared up the coast with a deafening noise, and thunder bellowed from the sky, and lightning was all the light they had. The swans were driven apart by the violence of the storm, and when at last the wind fell and the seas grew calm once more, Finella found herself alone on the ocean tide, not far from the seal rock, and thus she made this lament. Woe is me to be yet alive, my wings are frozen to my sides, well nigh has the tempest shattered my heart, and my comely hue parted from me. O oh, beloved ones, my three, who slept under the shelter of my feathers, shall you and I ever meet again, until the dead rise to life? Where is Fikra? Where is Hugh? Where is my fair Con? Shall I henceforth bear my part alone? Woe is me for this disastrous night. Vanilla remained on the seal rock until the morrow morn, watching the tossing waters in all directions around her, until at last she saw Con coming towards her, and his head dripping and feathers drenched and disarrayed. Joyfully did the sister welcome him, and ere long behold Fiacra also approaching them, cold and wet and faint, and his speech was frozen in him that not a word he spake could be understood. So Finella put her wings about him and said, If but Hugh came now, how happy we should be. In no long time after that they saw Hugh also approaching them on the sea, and his head was dry and his feathers fair and unruffled, for he had found the shelter from the gale. Finella put him under her breast, and Con under her right wing, and Fikra under her left, and covered them wholly with her feathers. O oh, children, she said to them, evil though you think this night to have been, many such a one shall we know from this time forward. So there the swans continued, 
suffering cold and misery upon the tides of Moyle, and one while they would be upon the coast of Alba, and another upon the coast of Erin, but the waters they may not leave. At length they came upon a night of bitter cold and snow such as they had never felt before, and Fenella sang this lament. Evil is this life, the cold of this night, the thickness of the snow, the sharpness of the wind. How long have they lain together under my soft wings, the waves beating upon us, Con and Hugh and Fikra? Aepha has doomed us, us the four of us, tonight to this misery, evil is this life. Thus for a long time they suffered, till at length there came upon the Straits of Moyle a night of January, so piercing cold that the like of it had never been felt, and the swans were gathered together upon the seal rock. The waters froze into ice around them, and each of them became frozen in place, so that their feet and feathers clung to the rock. And when the day came, they strove to leave the place, the skin of their feet and feathers of their breast clove to the rock, and they became naked and wounded away. Woe is me, O children of Lear, said Fenella. We are now indeed an evil case, for we cannot endure the salt water, yet we may not be away from it, and if the salt water gets into our sores, we shall perish. And of thus she sang. Tonight we are full of keening, no plumage to cover our bodies, and cold to our tender feet are the rough rocks all awash. Cruel to us was Aepha, who played her magic upon us, and drove us out to the ocean for wonderful snow-white swans. Our bath is the frothing brine, in the bay by the red rocks guarded, for meat at our father's table, we drink of the salt blue sea. Three sons and a single daughter, in the clefts of the cold rocks dwelling, the hard rocks cruel to mortals, we are full of keening tonight. So they went forth again upon the straits of Moyle, and the brine was grievously sharp and bitter to them, but they could not escape it or shelter from it. Thus they were, till at last their feathers grew again, and their sores were healed. On one day it happened that they came to the mouth of the river Ban in the north of Erin, and there they perceived a fair host of horsemen riding on white steeds, and coming steadily towards them from the southwest. Do you know who yon riders are, children of Lear? asked Finella. We know not, they said, but it is likely they are some party of the people of Dana. Then they moved to the margin of the land, and the company they had seen came down to meet them, and behold, it was Hugh and Fergus, the two sons of Bov the Red, and their nobles and attendants with them, who had long been seeking for the swans along the coast of the Straits of Moyle. Most lovingly and joyfully did they greet each other, and the swans inquired concerning their father Lear and Bov the Red and the rest of their kinsfolk. They are well, said the Danans, and at this time they are assembled together in the palace of your father at the hill of the White Field, where they will be holding the festival of the Age of Youth. They are happy and gay, and have no weariness or trouble, save that you are not among them, and that they have not known where you were since you left them at Loch Derivara. That is not the tale of our lives, said Finella. After that, the company of the Danans departed and brought word of the swans to Bov the Red and to Lear, who were rejoiced to hear that they were living. They said, The children shall obtain relief in the end of time. And the swans went back to the tides of Moyle and abode there till their time to be in that place had expired. When that day had come, Finella declared it to them, and they rose up wheeling in the air and flew westward across Ireland until they came to the Bay of Eris, and there they abode where it was ordained. Here it happened that among those of mortal men whose dwellings bordered on the bay was a young man of gentle blood by the name of Everick, who, having heard the singing of the swans, came down to speak with them and became their friend. After that he would often come to hear their music, for it was very sweet to him, and he loved them greatly, and they him. All their story they told him, and it was he who set it down in order, even as it is narrated here. Much hardship did they suffer from the cold and tempest in the waters of the western sea, yet not so much as they had to bear by the coasts of the ever-stormy moil, and they knew that the day of redemption was now drawing near. In the end of time, Fenella said, Brothers, let us fly to the hill of the white field and see how Lear, our father, and his household are fading. So they arose and set forward on their airy journey, 
until they reached the hill of the white field, and thus it was that they found the place, namely desolate and thorny before them, with naught but green mounds where once palaces and homes of their kin, and forests of nettles growing over them, and never a house nor a hearth. And the four drew closely together, and lamented aloud at that sight, for they knew that old times and things had passed away in Erin, and they were lonely in the land of strangers, where no man lived who could recognise them when they came to their human shapes again. They knew not that Lear and their kin of the people of Dana yet dwelt invisible in the bright world within the fairy mounds, for their eyes were holden that they could not see, since other things were destined for them than to join the Danan folk and be of the company of the immortal she. So they went back again to the western sea until the holy Patrick came to Ireland and preached the faith of the one God and of the Christ. But a man of Patrick's men, namely Saint Mukavog, came to the island of Inchgori in Eris Bay, and there built for himself a little church of stone, and he spent his life in preaching to the folk and in prayer. The first night he came to the island, the swans heard the sound of his bell ringing at matins on the following morn, and they leapt in terror, and the three brethren left Finola and fled away. Finola cried to them, What ails you, beloved brothers? We know not, they said, but we have heard a thin and dreadful voice, and we cannot tell what it is. That is the voice of the bell of Mokavog, said Finola, and it is that bell which shall deliver us and drive away our pains according to the will of God. Then the brethren came back and hearkened to the chanting of the cleric until matins were performed. Let us chant our music now, said Finola, and so they began and chanted a solemn, slow, sweet fairy song in adoration of the High King of Heaven and of Earth. Mokavog heard that, and wondered, and when he saw the swans, he spoke to them and inquired. They told him that they were the children of Lear. Praised be God for that, said Mukavog. Surely it is for your sakes that I have come to this island, above every other island that is Erin. Come to the land now, and trust in me that your salvation and release are at hand. So they came to the land, and dwelt with Mukavog in his house, and there they kept the canical hours with him and heard mass. And Mokavog caused a good craftsman to make chains of silver for the swans, and put one chain between Finola and Hugh, and the other between Con and Fikra. And they were a joy and solace of mind to the saint, and their own woe and pain seemed to them to dim, and become as far off as a dream. Now at this time it happened that the kin of Connet was Lergnan, son of Coleman, and he was betrothed to Decca, daughter of the king of Munster. And so it was that when Decca came northward to be wedded to Lergnan, she heard the tale of the swans and of their singing, and she prayed to the king that he would obtain them for her, for she longed to possess them. But Lergnan would not ask them of Mokavog. Then Decca set out homeward again, and vowed that she would never return to Lergnan till she had the swans, and she came as far as the church of Dalua, which is now called Kildalo in Clare. Then Lergnan sent messengers for the birds to Mokavog, but he would not give them up. At this, Lergnan was very wroth, and he himself went to Makavog, and he found the cleric and the four birds at the altar. But Lergnan seized upon the birds by their silver chains, two in each hand dragged them away to the place where Decca was, and Makavog followed them. But when they came to Decca, and she had laid her hands upon the birds, behold, their covering of feathers fell off, and in their places were three shrunken and feeble old men, and one lean and withered old woman, fleshless and bloodless from extreme old age, and Lergnan was struck with amazement and fear, and went out from that place. Then Finola said to Makavog, Come now and baptise us quickly, for our end is near, and if you are grieved at parting from us, know that also it is us who grieve. Do thou make our grave when we are dead, and place Con at my right side, and Fikra at my left, and hew before my face, for thus they were wont to be when I sheltered them on a many winter night by the tides of the moil. So Mokavog baptised the three brethren and their sister, and shortly afterwards they found peace and death, and they were buried even as Finola had said, and over their tomb a stone was raised, and their names and lineage graved on it in branching oakum, and lamentation and prayers were made for them, 
and their souls won to heaven. But Mukavok was sorrowful and grieved after them so long as he lived on the earth. Thank you for joining me for this legend. The Children of Lear is a tale full of symbols, meanings and transformation and the enduring bond of love that never diminished despite hardship and loss. Again, please check out the Murder and Myths podcast. My thanks to Kimberly and Kristen for their continued support. It's been such a pleasure to talk with you guys and I really do look forward to many more episodes. As always, feel free to get in touch with me by email, mlegendlore at gmail.com and at loremyth on Twitter. I'm Siobhan Clark and you've been listening to the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast. <laughs>